now welcome our esteemed guest of honor for the day, Mr. Bipin Pradeep Kumar. Mr. Bipin Pradeep Kumar is the co-founder and director at Gaia Smart Cities, a startup in the IoT space aimed at city-scale solutions. Gaia has won several accolades, including recently the mayor of London's top 20 emerging companies from India. Mr. Kumar is also the chairman of the Smart City Group for Telecom Engineering Center, TEC, GOT, Ministry of Communications and IT, Government of India. He is a member of UN for Smart Sustainable Communities Team and National Working Group on ITU's SG on Smart Sustainable Communities. Welcome to Communicate 18, sir. May I now request you to address the gathering. Namaste. Young, young women and young men of India, and uh, not just any young men and young women, but shaped by institutions like SITM and several other institutions that you are part of. I share a lot of things which, uh, which Rajan echoed, uh, uh, and um, in fact, uh, it's a tough act to follow after Rajan, as you must have gathered. Uh, but one thing that I kind of disagree with what Rajan said is about India. You know, we are, uh, well, to, we are at a phenomenal place, but I think we have a lot more to go. We have a, we have a huge, we have, uh, in the next few years, I think the India that we have today, it will be several times the India that we are today. It's pretty much, uh, it's pretty much, you know, to draw, to draw an analogy, it's like uh, the campus and the roads that we came in today. You know, 10 years from now, India would be like the campus that you're on, but try, right now, I think there's a lot of potholes and the roads are bad, still to get better. Uh, it, it's in the midst of all this that, uh, um, you know, uh, I'm here, and it's, it's a privilege, it's, it's an, indeed an honor to be here. Um, well, I, I was talking to Sakshi, the, the lady who brought me here, and after having seen, you know, your Prayukti and, the, and the, uh, the profiles of several of your students, it's amazing. It's really an honor to be here and to talk to you folks. So I'm not going to talk about technology. In fact, I'm going to take a completely different stand. Uh, Rajan spoke a lot about technology, and I'm sure several of the panelists are going to talk about all the new things, IoT, blockchain, AI, all these disruptive things that are there. I, on the other hand, am going to talk about some constants. Uh, these constants, as a startup, I'm, I am part of an institution called Gaia. We are a startup. Uh, these constants are the ones that have helped us move, helped us uh, tread new uh, territories, help us shape new paths. The first, and I, I would say the most important, the most, most important element in my learning is, is this. I call it the team. So if you may see this. And I put the, the picture of a plane here. Uh, anybody want to take a guess to why I put the picture of a plane here? To me, it's the most important element. The team is the most important element. I, I mean, I'm sure you have... Uh, group discussions and works in, you work in teams and all that. Why? Why have I put a plane there? Sorry? Okay, two. Because the natural order of everything on the plane, the natural order of everything on the plane is to fall down. That's what it is. It's gravity. The natural order is to fall down. But it's only by working together, it's only by working, you know, each part having its role, each part doing what it has to do, that the plane flies. If any, if any element on that plane didn't function the way it did, if any role that the part was supposed to play didn't play its role, the plane would fall down. It is that crucial, it is that crucial uh, for you to function as a team in the work that you all do tomorrow. The team is the most important element in my opinion. Uh, I, can't, I can't stress how much and how important the team is. The next, to me, the next most important element in Hindu mythology, in Hindu philosophy, and well, uh, we have something called Dharma. I'm sure you all know Dharma, you must have heard about it. I think there was a serial called Lost, you know, had, which had Dharma usually. So I'm sure all of you know what Dharma is. But Dharma is far more than just uh, uh, duty. I mean, typically it's called duty, but it's also conduct. So it's a very subtle word. Dharma is a very subtle word. Uh, it has several different connotations. It's up to you to interpret the connotation. As, as, as a corporate, as an industry, you're constantly faced with what is the right thing to do? What's the right code of conduct? What is your dharma? Uh, as a startup, again, uh, it, it comes in your face all the time. 
In fact, uh, if you look back at our books, you know, at our books, Mahabharata, the Gita, it doesn't really help us. Because in, in, in the Mahabharata itself, you know, Krishna tells Arjuna, I mean, he tells it in Sanskrit, of course, he doesn't tell it in English, but he says, casting, casting virtue, or casting aside virtue, sons of Pandu, adopt now some contrivance for gaining the victory. Contrivance obviously doesn't mean do things the right way, but do things in the way that you think is best, your goals, whatever that may be. Uh, do things in a manner, maybe you know, not right, maybe incorrect, but to achieve the goals that you need to achieve. Now that itself is you know, uh, uh, quite contrary to what many of us would, would, would have been taught, saying you know, our, books, uh, our books teach us saying that it's possibly not the right way to you do, do incorrect things to achieve your right goals. In fact, Krishna did several. In Krishna, uh, you know, there's something called Ashwatthama, and he said Ashwatthama is dead, the but the elephant actually died. He even covers, uh, cloaks the sun, thinking the, the, so that the, the war will end early. Um, he even tells secrets to, uh, to the, uh, so that, uh, you know, Bhima can actually break Durdhyana's leg. So all this is not the right way to do it, but uh, um, it gets done. Now you do not know whether, you do not know, and you're constantly faced with this conflict. Is it the right things to do? Is it the right way to do it? Should I, should I adopt unfair means to achieve my goals because my goals are superior? You're constantly faced with that, and I don't think there's a right answer. It's up to you to face it. It's up to you to, uh, you know, to take care of it. Uh, but at the end of it, and that's what I was heading to, the consequences, always remember the consequences. Krishna, in Krishna's lifetime, uh, I mean, it could be the consequences were that his entire clan perished, his family, everybody was completely gone. Uh, so you don't, know, you don't know where consequences actually take you. You don't know what, the, what are the consequences you have, but dharma amidst all this survives, and that's therefore for you to decide how to conduct yourself. The third, you know, I spoke about philosophy, and, uh, but it, it's truth. Again, you're constantly <coughs> faced with the dilemma of doing things the right way, telling the truth, but as long as you, I mean, you make mistakes. You make mistakes, realize it, accept the truth, move on. Uh, Ray Daliano, Ray Daliano is one of the, the biggest investors. In fact, he has a book called Race Principles. Um, you can probably download it, download it free. So he talks about several things that have shaped his career, that, that made him success. And he says, the most important thing is to have integrity and demand it from others. Also be radically transparent. In the corporate world, in, I mean, again, startup, um, probably you'll join several other institutions. You will always be faced with this, whether this is the right thing to do. But I would believe these constants saying that, you know, truth, adhere to it, it, it'll take you far away. So the other is on success and leadership. I've tried to draw an analogy. You, know, you all know the space-time continuum, right? 1905, uh, Einstein brought out the, the special theory of relativity. Before the special theory of relativity, space and time were two different entities. You know, space was considered something else, time was considered something else. But it's only the special theory of relativity in 1905 that it was brought together. He enmeshed it. He said space and time uh, are pretty much the same thing. It's called Minkowski. In, in, in fact, it's not, I mean, Einstein wasn't the one to be fully credited with. It's called Minkowski. In fact, it's called Minkowski, Minkowski space. And, uh, Together, at that time, he brought it together. I think we can draw a similar, similar analogy with success and leadership. And the more you have leadership qualities, I think the greater is the chance for your success. Um, pretty much like space and time, leadership and success is heavily enmeshed. And leadership is not something that somebody gives you, some, somebody bestows upon you. It is just taking into uh, uh, ownership. It's something that you design, you take steps. You are the one that takes it forward. It's up to you to be a leader, no matter in what space you are in. You can do several small things, but still be a leader. You need not have the title leader, CEO, CXO, whatever, but you can still be a leader. And leadership is what actually defines success. So yes, closely related, remember Einstein, space and time, it's the fourth dimension. Unless you have leadership, you won't succeed. Going forward, I mean, so those were constants that I spoke about. Non-technological uh, megatrends. I'm going to talk about two non-technological megatrends. And this is how uh, we are. This is what is going to shape us. Rajan spoke a lot about technology that's, that you will be seeing uh, as you move forward. But uh, you also need to be prepared for other things. 
This is the number of the people that entered the workforce in 2015. 12 million youth, 12 million students, 12 million folks like you. 12 million of you entered the workforce in 2015. Uh, how many of them actually got jobs? Anybody want to guess? Well, of course, half of our uh, uh, youth go into agriculture. That's, but how many of them actually got jobs? It's probably about uh, um, a, a 10%. How many of them got jobs in these eight sectors that everybody talks about, these big and these big companies? It's just 135,000. This is 2015 data. I was told the data for the next two years subsequently went down. I think this year it's picked up because of the EPFO uh, and you know, GST, you have to register yourself. So I think this year the data has gone up. But this is indicative of, this is a megatrend in one way. This is indicative of where we are going and how we are uh, not raising the kind of jobs that India needs to. Uh, it is up to you all to figure out how it is, what it is that needs to be done, what are the technologies that need to embrace, the IP that needs to be created, as Rajan spoke of, um, and therefore create more jobs, create more opportunities for you all. In all this, the, the sad part is we are not doing it today. Uh, we are a far cry from uh, several institutions, several other countries, China. China has leaps and bounds. Uh, you know, Rajan spoke of an institution which is generating standards for India, TSDSI. The equivalent to that in China is called uh, uh, China, Industri uh, China CISA, China National Standards Association. The number of standards that China generates is, is I think, for every 10,000 standards or documents that China, the reports that China generates in the last, uh, that China generated in the last three, four years, uh, I think we may have generated about 20, 30, maybe less than 100. Uh, the, the numbers are a, are a far cry, but also, that also talks about the immense potential and the opportunity that we have. I've seen the work that you have, all have done in, in your documents, Prayuth, you know, there is scope to take that to the larger space. It is now, the time is now, you guys have to do it. In, 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 among the, re the remaining 93% of people who don't get jobs, actually move to smaller companies, small medium enterprises, possibly, you know, startups like us, but uh, what happens there is that uh, there is no growth, you know. Uh, while, in, while there is a lot that India has to do, India also needs to create these opportunities for uh, companies to grow. I think rules and regulations are changing as we speak of uh, things like Startup India, although may not be a phenomenal success, they're learning and adapting, ad adopting the new, new, new terminologies too, new, new methods, uh, bureaucratic issues, I, I, well, I'd leave to, uh, the, to the several of the industry folks here to talk about that. Uh, all of this needs to change, and all of this needs to change with inputs from you all. Several of the industries uh, and the standardization issues, uh, the, the standardization bodies, uh, it's all public, but I don't see many institutions participating at all. That's <laughs> opportunity for you. And what happens, therefore, with this 93% is that over a period of time, they become unfit to compete. So this is one megatrend that is happening that's being seen across the Indian, uh, uh, the Indian uh, landscape. The other is, as, as most of you know, it's the impact of AI and automation. Um, Rajan spoke a lot. In strict numbers, in strict numbers, it is supposed to replace 370 million jobs. Now, uh, historically, no technology has killed jobs. Historically, no technology has skilled jobs. But this is the first time that technology is getting intelligent and technology is changing in a way to address several new, several jobs that people, only people could do. But again, I don't believe automation, AI, and it's not just me, I think it's a sh if you do enough Google search, you'll find that most people share the opinion that technology, AI, et cetera, won't really re uh, uh, kill jobs, but it'll replace jobs, it'll displace jobs. So what it means is all of us here needs to constantly reskill, upskill, and the opportunities for that are again uh, something what you know was spoken earlier. You have to constantly learn. You have to constantly change, uh, because in in when you stop, it is pure death for all of us. Not just I, I, in many ways, possibly for humanity too. So that's the number. Uh, where, uh, you know, how, um, in fact, this is a McKinsey report that spoke about how many, how many occupations are susceptible to, to change. Uh, it's up to all of us 
generate the IP, generate the potential in terms of intellectual cap capital that will not, that'll prevent this from happening. The last, I'm talking, this is my last uh, slide, I'm gonna keep it short. Uh, this is a report that came out from Economist. It talks about, in, in, in fact, the, the title was, uh, the, uh, the report is titled Missing Indian Middle Class. It talks about India the way it is today and how what we believe is not really uh, what, it, what it appears to be. In fact, there are several myths. Um, so according to that article, according to the report, and I, I largely believe in it, there, are, there is just 1% of India that actually generate earnings of more than 50 lakhs. Just 1% of India. Maybe that 15 lakhs could be slightly more, 20, 25, maybe it, you can go, go to that number, but that's just 1% of India. And this says, in the, in, in, uh, in the shape of the world, it's pretty much equivalent just to the size of Hong Kong. Uh, another 9% is probably all of us middle class people. It's like Central Europe, you know, enjoys a fair level of comfort. Uh, a lot of things are bought here. There's a lot of economic activity that happens here. The socioeconomic factors here are significantly higher. Uh, the remaining 40%, uh, sorry, another 40%, is like Bangladesh and Pakistan. Huge, huge swaths of India are like this. But uh, what is even, I mean, what is dis completely disconcerting is that almost 50% of India is like, uh, you know, large bits of Africa. Now, this is data that is out there in the open. But uh, something that uh, me, as, as a startup, what we have found completely um, baffling is that you know, when, a, when students or when new companies come, a new company is formed, new technologies are formed, they are pretty much formed, new solutions are formed, new products are created, new services are created, they are probably just formed to create, to address the 10%, the 1% and the 9% of India. There is hardly any solution that caters to the remaining 90% of India. The remaining 90% is almost left unaddressed. 50% forget it, nobody even looks at it. Most of the, as the youngsters, most of people like us that bring in, that talk about technology, that talk about technology creating impact, social impact, economic impact, cultural impact, we really don't focus on the 50% that really needs it. You know, that whole value at the bottom of the pyramid still needs to be realized. There is, I'm sure but it really needs to be realized. These are megatrends uh, that uh, you know, are ripe for opportunities. And youngsters like you, uh, youngsters you know, educated, know what it is, can change in there, that's where opportunities lie. And I hope several of you embrace it. Uh, with this, yes, I'll end my uh, presentation, Jehan. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for such an enriching address. It's a matter of immense honor to have you here with us today.